Hi, uh, welcome to lesson two of week two of Julia programming for nervous beginners. So today we're talking about number types. Um, we are really doing it so that we can talk about types in Julia. Number types are, are a good way to start, and I'll say I'll answer this question: Why number types so early in the course? Um, but after this lesson, you'll be able to motivate why we do number types so very early in the course. You'll be able to describe the types in 64 and float 64. You'll be able to use bit string to display the bits pattern of a number. You'll be able to show that a floating point number uh, equal to an integer has a different bits pattern from the integer. And you'll be able briefly to describe uh, some types for integer and floating points which use fewer than 64 bits per number. So why mention number types so early in the course? And there's really basically two reasons. The first is that many error messages actually mention number types. Let's just look at attempting to index with uh, 1.0. So if we say um, we have the string ABC and we want to index to the second place in the string, and or let's say the first, but instead of one, we absentmindedly type 1.0, and it says, no, we cannot use a float 64 to get an index. Um, and the second reason is that they make a good introduction to the type system of Julia, and this is actually a really important topic, which we will expatiate on a bit later in the course. So the in 64 type. So you've seen that a character has variable width in, number, in terms of a number of code units. And by contrast, number values of a given type have all got the same width. It is measured in bits, not in, in number of code units. And an int 64 is an int integer value that occupies 64 bits. So um, let's just look at bit string of 1. So the number 1 is entered like that. It's uh, an integer because we haven't used any decimal point. The number 2 is like that, the number 3 is like that, and the number 4 like that. So this is the number 1. Then it has all zeros except a 1 at the end. This then has a 0, 1 at the end, and this is 1, 1. This is actually the number 2 to the value 0. It's 1 times 2 to the 0 is 1. So this is 0 times 2 to the 0 plus 1 times 2 to the 1. 1 uh, times 2 to the 0 plus 1 times 2 to the 1. And then this is 1 times 2 to the 2. And that's how we get 1, 2, 3, 4. And all of these, this is uh, 2 to the uh, 0. And this is 2 to the 63. Um, let's look at 7, it's 1 less than 8, look at 13, and just look at the negatives of those, so minus 13, oh dear, minus 7, well, 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 so we see that um, if we take this, uh, Let's say, look at the bit string of 7 again. There's a match here of all the zeros and all the ones. And if we compare 13 and minus 13, then again, we see that there's a match. These, um, apart from the very last one, they seem to have the same, uh, they seem to have where that one is a zero, that one is a one, and vice versa. And then the last one, they're the same. And for minus seven, it's also true. So there's some kind of correlation between plus and minus. It's not actually important for you to know how these um, bit strings really work, how, particularly how a negative number is, is is done. Uh, you might imagine that here is the number one, so you imagine that minus one will have 
ones all around, and what does it do at the last one? That might still be a one. So minus one is all ones. So the technical details of why it is like this it has to do with a long history in computing, and we don't have to go into that. Um, it's just that we have a very large number of integers that can be represented with bit strings, always just 64 bit strings. When I say a very large number, I mean all the ones starting with minus 922333 so da, 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 up to 92237. This is approximately minus 9 times 10 to the 18, and that's approximately 9 times 10 to the 18. So um, quite a lot of numbers um, can be represented, all of the integers from there to there. Um, if possible, a bit string contains the numbers, the bits representation of its argument. So, um, and this includes character values, because characters actually also ha have a bit string representation. Let's demonstrate that. So, um, if I take the string, um, a and alpha and plus minus. And I want that to be a string. And what I want is to put that into a comprehension. What is the comprehension going to be? It's just going to display the bit string of every x. So if I say I want the bit string of x for every x in that string. So um, the first character comes up with many, many zeros and digits. This is a single code point. And the rest of the code points are not needed, so they're just padded out. And then the next one has a uh, code point uh, width of two, and it comes out like this. And the next point, one also has a code point width of two. I can, um, I think Aleph has a code point width of three. Yeah. Um, but it is actually these higher code points um, is not displayed on this screen here. So that we have three different, um, and there may even, there are some characters in Unicode which use all four code points, but as far as I know, they're not available in Julia. So this illustrates the difference in the width of the different characters. Um, when you put your characters into the string, these zeros are suppressed and only the actual code points are used. So, floating point numbers are very, very different. And the way we know is we put decimal places in there. So let's look at the bit strings of 1.0, 0 0.1, 0 .1, and 1.1. 1 .1. um, So I'm going to now I'm going to make that a, a vector 1.0 0 0.1 0 1.1 1 .1. Uh, sorry bit string is a function And now we see that this is really fundamentally different. Um, we can't represent 0 0.1 and 1.1 as integers. We can only look at this integer. But if we have bit string 1, you recall, looks like that. And bit string 1.0 looks like that. So this bit string 1.0 has a lot of values in there. And bit string 10.0, again, most of the action is over here on the left rather than anything on the right. The numbers 0.1 comes out like this, and 1.1 1 
is really the sum of these two. So we add 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Where are they different? 1 and 1.1 1 .1 differ in many, many places, but 0 0.1 and 1.1, 1 .1, they start to differ over here. And so they only differ in this position here. So all these differences between the bit strings of the different kinds of numbers are not important. All we want you to see is that they have very different patterns. And the important point of that is that you cannot add the bits together if they've got different patterns. So when we want to add two numbers, we, what we do is you convert the, from the one to the other. And in practice, we convert the int 64 into a float 64. And then we operate on the float 64. And the reason for that is that all int 64s can be approximated fairly accurately with a float 64. But uh, a float 64, if it has a fractional 1.2 or 33 over 7 or something, that cannot be well approximated by an integer. And so we don't try and use integers to model the uh, computations on floats. We do it the other way around. So we turn all our integers into floats. So when we have 1 plus 1 1.0, then it comes up as 2. And I can ask for the bit string of that. And um, the bit string of 2.0 is a whole lot of zeros there. So look, this is the bit string of 1, like that. And then this is the bit string of 2. And the bit string of 3 It's just an extra little one over here. So these are very, very simple bit strings. But the pattern is something a little bit mysterious. You can read up on floating point numbers if you want to understand the pattern. So. Float is actually interesting in other ways as well. There uh, is the biggest actual number is 1.7 times uh, 10 to the 308. So that is uh, 1.7 times. And then let's make sure that we have 10 to the power 308. That can be an integer or it can be a, it can be an uh, oh, I need to have 10.0 because it's using 10 as an integer. I have to have 10.0. And then that tells us E308. If I have 308.0, it still uses E308. So although I have a, a fraction there, if I have 30, uh, let's say 307.5, um, it still has an uh, an integer over here and that over there. So whether or not we use integers actually doesn't really matter too much, but I will always use integers. So if that, um, that's our value. Now let's see what happens if I have 1.8. It tells me inf. Oh dear. And I can also take 1.7 and multiply that by 2. And again, I get inf. So inf is a number that, in a sense, represents infinity. It's not a number. It's a, it's a value. It's a floating point value. But it's not actually a number. It's a number that is bigger than any other floating point value. And in that sense, it is like infinity for the real numbers, because infinity is bigger than any real number. But uh, it does not actually behave like a number. And it is in Julia, it is there to indicate that you've done something like trying to get too big, too, too big a number, or you try, try to divide by zero or something, and you get an infinite value, or something like an infinite value. It's a con concept. We don't have to talk about the mathematics of it, because uh, although it's very interesting. Um, but it's not part of this course again. Uh, similarly, you have undefined numbers. So if you have 0 divided by 0, then that's not a number. So inf is a value. It's a value that's bigger than any other value. But nan is not a value. We don't know anything about it. Similarly, if we want to have inf 
times zero, we get none. But if we have inf times inf, we get another inf. Um, and finally, let's talk at the shorthand. So this uh, number here, um, let's go there, is actually possible to render just like this. So um, it's a convenient shorthand that we can use to render big numbers and write big numbers down. Uh, but interestingly enough, it actually operates in a slightly different way. So we have seen that um, 1.8 times 10 to the 308, this actually gives us inf. We've seen that. And if we do it this way, then it says overflow. So there was um, something different happened between these two things. Julia did things in a different way, and this one came to a, an error message. And that come, came to a float 64 value. So this sort of thing can also happen. It's one of the subtleties of numerical computations that you don't always know exactly what the result is going to be, depending on how you just, we would have thought that this is actually equivalent to that, but it turns out it is not. These are not subtleties that play any role in this course. You can have a reduced width, so instead of int64, you can use int8. Instead of float64, you can use float32. There are others. And um, when you use only 8 bits rather than 64, you need only one eighth of the memory to represent the number. So you can do much faster computations. You can store your results or you, everything in much more compactly and in less memory. But you pay for it by having fewer numbers available. So int 8, which is only one eighth of int 64 in width, only gives you the integers from minus 128 to 127. So suppose um, I say int 32 of 13. Then it just comes up as 13. If I say bit string int 32 of 13. Then you see it's much shorter, and if I make it int 8, there are only 8 bits. Um, so we've scratched the surface of the Julia number types. There are many other number types, including complex and exact rational numbers. But it is not necessary for a beginner to master them. No, let's review. The main number types are int64 and float64. Int64 starts at roughly minus 9 to the 10 to the 18 and goes up to 9 times 10 to the 18 approximately. Uh, the numerical values range from approximately minus 1.7 times 10 to the 308 to plus 1.7. 10 to the 308, and it has a lot of the fractional values and many of the integers, but not all of them. You can see that 10 to the 308, much bigger range. So um, it also uses 64 bits to represent this much bigger range of numbers. So although it includes fractions, it leaves quite a few of the numbers out anyway as well. Float64 numbers can approximate fractions, and when we use float64 and int64 together, then we're actually always doing the computation in, with float64 numbers. And float64 values include the values inf and nan. They don't re represent any actual numbers. They rep this nan represents uh, the result of a computation like uh, 0 over 0, which is undefined, and inf. Uh, represents the result of an, a, a computation that gives a number bigger than any number that you can represent. And that's what we want to say about numbers and number types in Julia.